Elie Wiesel, Nobel laureate and Holocaust survivor, once said, for the dead and the living, we must bear witness. As an advocate for Holocaust education, these are words I do not take lightly. But people in this field are faced with a new challenge. Survivors are aging rapidly, generational gaps are shifting, and there's a real fear that when the last survivor passes away, we will lose our connection with the past and with it the ability to effectively convey those messages in the prevention of future atrocities. So what do we as Holocaust historians and society need as a whole? The answer is twofold. First, we must acknowledge that the Holocaust was undoubtedly one of humanity's greatest failures in ethical behavior and treatment of other humans. It is an example of how ordinary people can become active participants in genocide without being on the ground participating in the killing. We must acknowledge that the Holocaust did not begin with death camps and mass extermination and ghettoization. It crept quietly into society through public policy, media, and complacency to a corrupt regime. The Holocaust required cooperation from all sectors of community. From the teachers who taught anti-Semitism in their classrooms, the business people who capitalized on the cheap labor provided by those interned in camps, the transit workers who kept the trains running with extreme efficiency, and the international community that knew about Auschwitz, the gas chambers, and mass extermination, but refused to act. It was a collective effort and therefore a collective failure one that should make all people question their ethics and behaviors. Moving forward, we must remember the role that ordinary people played. We must be accountable for speaking out against injustice. We must be accountable for not becoming bystanders. We must be accountable for humanity, regardless of our race, religion, or creed. Second, we must use that, that accountability to become ambassadors of truth of listening to survivors' stories and openly sharing them, of remembering the importance of Holocaust education as a testament to what happens when humanity fails. Now, I understand that not everybody has the privilege of knowing or being able to connect with a Holocaust survivor, but I have had that privilege. And I stand here today to share with you those stories in the hopes that you will tell your children, your families, your friends, and your coworkers and through collective memory, we can cultivate a community that remembers and shares those testimonials, even when the last survivor is gone. To begin this sharing, we have to start with humanizing the statistics. It's estimated that 11 million people were murdered during the Holocaust. That is a staggering number. But it's all the more staggering when you finally realize that all 11 million people were people. They loved, had jobs, maybe drank too much wine on the weekend, played sports, had families, lived. I'm sharing with you today only two of those stories, but there are millions more. Some lost forever because every single member of an extended family was exterminated. The moment the Holocaust became humanized for me was in February of 2007. I was selected to take part in an intensive Holocaust education program focused on Terezin, a former Nazi ghetto not far outside of Prague. It is here that I was introduced to Petter. Petter had an interesting story. He was Czech, but only half Jewish. However, in the eyes of the Nazis, that was Jewish enough. I related deeply to Petter. He, like myself, was a lover of literature, a fan of Jules Verne, an artist, a poet, insatiably curious about the world around him. Petter was incredibly ambitious. He had written five novels and countless short stories before he turned 14. In October 1942, Petter's name was included on a deportation list. And because he had reached the age of 14, he could be deported alone. He was taken from his family and sent to Terezin. Despite being only a child and traumatically removed from his pet family, Petter remained incredibly optimistic. He teamed up with other young people in the camp and founded a secret magazine showcasing poetry, artwork, and writing from others in the camp. He was, in my mind, destined for greatness. I followed Petter's story through Terezin, the winding streets of the ghetto, and eventually to the tracks that led to Auschwitz, where this incredible young man's story ended. Deported to Auschwitz in September of 1944, Petter did not make it past the initial selection. He was murdered in the gas chambers almost immediately upon his arrival. 
his incredible story was extinguished. I remember that moment vividly, standing on the tracks leading from Terezin to Auschwitz, mourning the loss of a boy I never knew but felt I knew deeply. In that moment of crushing realization, all 11 million stopped being a collective. They all became petter. They all became individuals. I was fundamentally changed. I knew I had to do something. I could never right the wrongs committed against the victims of the Holocaust, but I could do my best to educate myself, to be a voice for the voiceless, to bear witness to those who perished and those who survived. Over 10 years after my introduction to Petter, I had done my best to keep that promise. I diligently studied the events of the Holocaust. I absorbed as much information as I could, but there was one key area that I failed. I didn't share those stories. So in July of 2018, when I was selected to take part in a program through the Holocaust Awareness Museum and Education Center, interviewing and recording the stories of survivors, it was pointed out to me that this was a perfect time to act on the area I had failed. I was being asked to bear witness to somebody's story, and I made a promise to myself and that survivor that I would not only bear witness, but I would take her story and share it with others to allow it to become one that humanized the Holocaust for others. In August, I flew to Philadelphia to meet Annalise in her home. I was greeted with an embracing open arms, a full feast, and a witty comment about how crazy I was to fly from Canada just to hear her story. For the next few hours, we sat, we ate, she talked, and I listened. Annalise grew up in Bonn. Her father was an educator and a cantor at the local synagogue. Her mother was a known philanthropist who would give anything to anybody in need. Annalise grew up during the rise of Nazism. She remembers vividly the Nazi flags and parades. As a child, she would attend the parades without fully comprehending the impact they would have later in her life. Restrictions on Jews and Bonn came gradually and then like a whirlwind. It started with her not being able to swim in the pool. Then she could no longer attend the Shirley Temple movies she loved so dearly. Finally, they closed her school. But the moment the danger became real to Annalise was in November 1938. Uniformed Nazis descended on cities across Germany, burning synagogues and Jewish businesses, arresting Jewish men, and murdering approximately 100 people. Annalise's synagogue, her second home, the place she had watched her father sing as cantor, was burned to the ground. The day became known as Kristallnacht, it was a Nazi initiative to see how the public reacted to their policies on the Jews. There was no public outcry, no protest, only silent acceptance of a regime and their plans. From Crystal knocked on, the progression to genocide was rapid. Annalise and her family were taken from their home, they were detained in a cloister, and then they were eventually transported to Terezin. It was in Terezin that Annalise was witness to an incredible failure of the international community. After outcries from the Danish government to see where Danish Jews were being detained, the Nazis agreed to allow the International Red Cross to visit Terezin. Prior to the visit, the prisoners of the camp were forced to beautify the ghetto. Those who were sick or elderly were hidden away. Fake shops and cafes were established. Children were instructed to play and an orchestra of, Jews, or orchestra of Jews played the requiem for the visiting Red Cross. The route was well planned. The Red Cross didn't investigate further. And when they left, Annalise and countless others were deported, having served their purpose to the Nazi propaganda machine. When Annalise was leaving Auschwitz, or leaving Terezin, she had to leave behind her ailing grandmothers and father. Her aunt, herself, and her mom were put on a cattle car and sent to Auschwitz. Despite having to leave her family behind, she still hadn't shed a tear. It wasn't until she arrived at Auschwitz that the tears would come. In a desperate attempt to hold on to the memory of her father, Annalise took with her a photo, small and circular, ripped from a much larger image, the face of her father. She knew that if she was caught with it, it would be taken, or worse, she would be punished, so she hid it in her cheek for safekeeping. As she stood in line, the image began to dissolve. 
the last connection with her father disappearing. In that moment, she wept. Annalise was able to survive Auschwitz, was transported to Freiburg, and eventually to Mauthausen. Two days before liberation, Annalise was sent to the gas chambers. Due to a lack of Zyklon B due to Allied bombing, she was sent back to her barracks. Two days later, she was liberated by the Americans. Shortly after liberation, her mother died of tuberculosis, and Annalise came to New York as an orphan. Annalise would return to Auschwitz for the 71st anniversary of its liberation. And it was there amongst friends and strangers that she shared an incredible story of kindness and loss. When she had first arrived at Auschwitz with her mother and her aunt, she was terrified. Her aunt had heard stories about what awaited them at Auschwitz, so she made a decision. She pulled from her pocket a small piece of chocolate she had been saving and said, let us share it. Together, Annalise, her mom, and her aunt shared that small piece of chocolate, crammed in a cattle car on the brink of uncertainty. It was, in her words, their last moment of togetherness. When they departed the train, Annalise and her mother were sent in one direction and her aunt in the other. Annalise's last memories of her aunt, aside from the sharing of that chocolate, were watching her stand in line waiting for her death at the gas chambers. When Annalise returned to Auschwitz, she took with her a bag of chocolate and asked those that were with her, friends and strangers, to share that chocolate in honor of her aunt and all of the victims of the Holocaust. On each of your tables, I have placed chocolate. I ask each of you to join me now in sharing this chocolate in honor of Annalise and her bravery and survival in memory of her aunt who gave her a moment to hang on to in the horror that was to come. In honor of Petter, whose genius was never realized, and as a promise that we will remember their stories, we will share them, and we will keep the memory of the Holocaust alive. Thank you. <laughs>